Good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rob Whittle, uh, managing partner at Dietyaxi here in the U.S. This it gives me great pleasure to introduce Seth Briskin, to who's going to talk to us about U.S. employment law essentials today. Uh, as some of you, as quite a few are aware, we do one of these sort of webinars every sort of three to four months with respect to items that we think are very useful and have significant differences between UK, UK law and US law. So as we've done before, we will try and go through and try and highlight some of the important differences uh, so that you get something valuable from the webinar. But like I said, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Seth. Uh, Seth is the chair of the uh, employment law section at his firm at Myers Roman. Uh, he does a lot of work with UK, EU, and Canadian firms that come to the US, so he's very familiar with sort of the basics of UK employment law. His, his firm is a member of an organization called LawPack, which enables him to have access to resources all across the US, depending on what state you're in. And uh, as I was going to say, he has actually, uh, I think some of you on the call have most probably actually worked with Seth in the past, so uh, his, his name will not be a new name to you. But that being said, uh, I'd like to hand it over to Seth, who will go through what we think are some important U.S. employment law essentials that you need to know about. Seth, I'll hand it over to you. Great. Thanks, Rob. Um, well, good morning or good afternoon, depending where you're calling from, I suppose. Uh, the first part of the presentation, obviously, here in the U.S., we're dealing with a, a significant change in the White House, uh, which is getting a lot of attention, not just in the U.S., but I believe internationally as well. Uh, some of these uh, issues um, will be di directly affecting business. We're seeing a great deal of uh, upset among the female uh, population of our country right now, um, which also has some employment law uh, interface as well. So what we're going to start out with First is just we're entering a new four-year term of, of, of President Trump, and at least on the first slide here, uh, what I'm trying to indicate are some of the things that President Trump has spoke about while campaigning and from his early on appointments and things like that, we are starting to see him give hints as to what he's going to do in the employment law realm and what will be directly affecting businesses or companies that want to do business in the U.S. So in no particular order, uh, I've listed a bunch of them here, and there's some that I think are much more significant than others. So first one off is the labor relations piece. Uh, you know, President Trump in his prior life and current life is a businessman and has had lots of, shall we say, bad interactions with the government over the years. So uh, some of his appointments are going to be in direct relation to trying to loosen the standards that some of these agencies that have given him trouble in the past, uh, what they will be doing going forward. So labor relations is a key one. And President Trump is going to have the opportunity to uh, select at least two members of what's called the National Labor Relations Board, which is the government agency that oversees workplaces dealing with unions and employers. So that's very important. Uh, over the last eight years, President Obama has, has had a stacked NLRB, and it has been decidedly pro-union, uh, and that is certain to change under a Trump administration. While the NLRB has very, been very pro-union, and President Obama tried to support unions whenever possible through executive orders or other things, uh, unions honestly have not made any headway in the U.S. during the last eight years. They continue to be stagnant and or declining, and we can expect unions to continue that downward trend in a Trump administration. Seth, just quickly, what does NLRB stand for? Sorry, it's the National Labor Relations Board, uh, and that is the government agency that oversees unions and, and employers. So uh, the next big one, and he made no secret about this during his uh, campaign, that's immigration. Uh, his whole stand on building a wall. We'll see whether that ever comes to fruition, but clearly immigration is a big issue for President Trump, and even if he doesn't go about building a wall, a physical wall, there's all kinds of other uh, governmental walls he can put up that create issues on the immigration front, and we'll talk a little bit more about those as we go. The Supreme Court, again, a major, major 
power of the president, he gets to appoint at least one seat on the Supreme Court, which can also have employment law impact because lots of employment law issues do end up before the Supreme Court. Uh, why do I say he's going to pick at least one? Well, there's one empty seat, and there's at least two or three justices that are in excess of high 70s, 80 years old. So however long they they hold on, uh, he will have to deal with them. Otherwise, he will get to appoint replacements for them as well. Uh, wage and hour law is going to be a big ticket issue, and it's already been a big ticket issue. Even before President Trump came in, uh, various states filed a lawsuit to block a major change in wage and hour law that was going to increase the white collar exemption for salaried individuals uh, and raise the threshold of what it takes to be an exempt employee. And by exempt, I mean not eligible for overtime. So that's already been blocked. The Department of Labor has appealed it, but President Trump's pick for the DOL, uh, Mr. Pudza, is, a, is the former CEO of a fast food chain uh, who has no love for the Department of Labor, certainly no love for overtime laws, and so that change is almost certain to die on the vine. Uh, employment leave, just briefly, President Trump ran on an idea of providing paid maternity leave, and we'll see if that comes through. And then workplace safety, OSHA, has always been a thorn in President Trump's side when building uh, hotels and things, and that's almost certain to get defunded and limited in his administration. Next slide, uh, again, I'm just touching on a few other things that I think are going to be important. Uh, as we mentioned before, whether or not he creates a wall or not really doesn't matter much uh, if you're not in Mexico. Uh, so what else can he do? He can do things with regard to E-Verify, toughening up uh, the U.S.'s position on work visas and making them available, H, uh, H-1Bs and things like that. Uh, before you start asking me lots of immigration questions, I will tell you wholeheartedly I am not an immigration lawyer, but a lot of immigration issues do creep into employment law, so I have to deal with them from time to time, but I always bring in good immigration counsel whenever I need to for, for those things. Seth, just to interject, I, sure. I forgot to mention as a housekeeping, please, please note that you can type in questions as we're going along, and we will answer as many of them at the end of the session that we can, and what we can't answer, we'll get back to you afterwards. So please, uh, any questions you have, Please type them in. Thanks. So uh, the E-Verify process is a fairly streamlined process in terms of making sure that employees are eligible to work in the U.S. If It currently isn't the case, but if uh, President Trump wants to, he can make that a required uh, check on all employees, and that would limit somewhat the ability for uh, immigration and, and non-U.S. individuals to work here. But at the moment, anyway, <clears throat> Seth, the, you're supposed to, when you take on an employee here, you're supposed to go through a protocol to determine that based on the information that you're provided that they are an eligible employee already, aren't you? Right. There's I-9 forms and things like that that you have to fill out. Uh, the E-Verify system is a little more um, robust than just filling out an I-9 form, which can be filled out erroneously, shall we say. Okay. Um, executive orders. President Obama was a big fan of executive orders. Uh, mostly for the reason that he couldn't get anything legislated. So uh, because of, this, of the stalemate in Congress, uh, President Obama used his power of executive orders quite a bit, made a lot of changes, and most, if not all of them, I would expect to be rescinded by a Trump administration. So that's already happening with regard to fair pay, safe workplaces, uh, and he's going to be, uh, President Trump is going to be rescinding some others, I have a feeling, as well. Uh, final rules re uh, revised for the EEO-1 pay reporting. This involves only large employers with over 100 employees, but uh, what the EEOC was looking to do was gather a lot of information in order to support their efforts to sue larger employers for uh, all manner of discrimination claims. Uh, again, I mentioned the NLRB, National Labor Relations Board, 2-1 Democratic majority. That is going to change in the Trump administration. And Department of Labor opinion letters make, make a comeback. DOL, the Department of Labor, used to, uh, if you asked them to, uh, or if you had a question about how certain things applied, you could write them a nice letter and they'd send you a nice letter back with a decision or an opinion that you could rely on going forward uh, during the Obama administration and a little bit before, actually, 
uh, the DOL got out of that business and as a result employers often didn't know what to do or what the proper thing to do with uh, their pay uh, options. <clears throat> Seth, would I be right in saying that when you come to different government organizations that you need to be aware of as an employer when it comes to employment law the Department of Labor is the department that you need to make sure you're completely compliant and the one you need to be concerned about? Yeah, if, if I had to gauge what the most active government agencies uh, are, it would certainly be the Department of Labor because the Department of Labor covers not just wage and hour law, uh, they also oversee OSHA, which is the Occupational Safety and Health Act and, uh, and administration, and OSHA has never been more active than it's been under the Obama administration. So when you when you add together the wage and hour and the safety all under the DOL's umbrella, DOL without question is the big one. EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, that is a big one as well. Uh, the NLRB to a lesser degree unless you have a union. Uh, those are the big ones. Obviously IRS for tax. Yeah. Yeah. Just a couple other things here that President Trump has mentioned out on the campaign trail that we should be looking out for, and that is renegotiation of NAFTA, of course. He's going to be looking at all the U.S. trade agreements and un, uh, undoubtedly uh, getting us out of them, renegotiating them, and starting from scratch. Uh, he mentioned a small business exemption from the overtime rule. Uh, his own people don't really agree with him on this necessarily. Uh, but he wanted to create an exemption for small business so that small businesses didn't have to pay overtime, which would be nice for small businesses, assuming you can stay competitive by not doing that. But that was something he mentioned. Uh, likely decreased regulations across the board. Uh, you can just expect President Trump to try to limit or eliminate uh, all government regulations whenever possible to assist businesses in, in doing more business. Uh, Following his daughter's advice, he came out during the campaign in favor of six weeks of paid maternity leave. Uh, we'll see if that comes to fruition. But in the meantime, lots of states have already taken this on. So again, you need to be cognizant of state law when you do business there. But at a, at a federal level at the moment, the statute says if somebody goes on maternity leave, which is a huge difference from the UK and European laws, is at the moment it, you don't have to pay you wouldn't have to pay them. It's it's in a sense it's just time you take off, correct? Right. And if and really the law that covers this, and we'll talk about it in a little bit, called the Family Medical Leave Act, it really only applies to somewhat larger employers that have 50 or more employees. Some states have smaller versions or or mini FMLA policies, but again, even the FMLA, the federal law, does not require paid leave. It requires only unpaid job protected benefit protected leave uh, that can be taken consecutively or intermittently. So, And if we talk about job protection, how many weeks in general is that in the UK? Because in the UK, generally, you can take off to 12 months of maternity leave. Some of it's paid, some of it's unpaid, but your job is kept open for you. What's the equivalent in the US? 12 weeks. 12 weeks. At That's moment. it. Yep. Now, I think you bring up a good point, which I think when we talked the other day is to stress is that we're talking a lot here about federal law, yes. but state law is can be different. And Am I right in thinking that if there's a different state law, it actually overrides the federal law? Yeah, if, if the state law does more than the federal law, and by more I mean is more restrictive or provides more benefits than the federal law, then the state law will control. But state law cannot trump, that's a pun, uh, uh, cannot trump federal law if it does less. So, for instance, if there was a Family Medical Leave Act state law that lowered the burden from 50 employees down to 25 or 20 state law would apply because it affects more employers and, and that would that would rule the day for, for you as your business uh, in that state. Uh, lastly, just you can expect President Trump to reduce taxes for businesses and he's already started the process of repealing the Affordable Care Act, which provides uh, access to insurance even if the company doesn't provide it. So before we get into the uh, all the different laws that we're going to cover today, I want to touch on a, a big issue that is a major difference between uh, uh, UK law, EU law, Canadian law, and that's the concept of employment at will. Employment at will is sort of the bedrock of employment law in the US. It applies to 49 of the 50 states, and if 
even the one state that doesn't truly follow employment at will, and that state is uh, Montana, even Montana follows uh, at will for a period of time uh, initially uh, during the employment process. So what is at will employment? At will means that uh, either the employee or the company can terminate the employment relationship with or without cause, with or without notice, for any reason under the sun, good, bad, indifferent, morally wrong, without legal liability. Now there's a little bit of a caveat on the employer side. Yeah, you can terminate somebody for any reason under the sun, but it cannot be an illegal reason or a retaliatory reason. So we'll talk a little bit about what that means in a little bit. But would I also be right in thinking that if you did terminate somebody and you did it within the statute, that person could still file a lawsuit against you because they believe it's not for a, a proper reason and they would still try and sue you potentially? Yeah, I mean, blissfully for me as a defense lawyer, uh, employees can sue you for anything here in the U.S. So uh, whether it's meritorious or not, uh, someone could bring a lawsuit, but as we'll see in a little bit, there's only certain uh, reasons that an employee could bring a meritorious lawsuit here in the States. It has to be a wrongful termination, and by wrongful, I don't mean unfair in, in the eyes of the employee. I mean it has to violate a law in some way, and lots of employees and lots of employers get that one wrong all the time. Um, oftentimes when I talk about employment at will, uh, business owners will get it confused with right to work. That's another uh, concept that's out there, and it does not affect every state, but it's a state law issue, and what right to work means is that if a union, it has only to do with unions, but if your company has a union come to it, and let's say you have 100 employees, if 51 of them vote for the union, and 49 of them vote against the union, in a right to work state, those 49 individuals don't have to join the union. So certain states in the U.S. have this right to work law, and those generally are located in the southeastern part of the U United States, and then straight up the middle of the United States, Texas and all the big states up the middle of the U.S. Just recently, or fairly recently, Michigan is a right to work state, Indiana has become a right to work state, and most recently, Kentucky has become a right to work state. If you are not a right to work state, like Ohio is not a right to work state, uh, New York is not a right to work state, uh, if you're not a right to work state in that same union election, those 49 employees who voted against the union have to join the union or else they're terminated. So that's a difference and sometimes people get it confused with it, employment at will, but that is not what at will employment is. Um, I'll mention one other thing with employment at will that uh, that uh, bollocks is up, if I can use the term correctly, uh, uh, lots of UK and Canadian and EU employers, and that's the idea that if you terminate somebody for any old reason, there is no law that says that you have to pay them any severance pay. So there is no requirement in the US to pay severance when you terminate an employee. Might you want to? Yes, and there's lots of reasons for that, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but there's no law that requires it. And the same would go with redund what we'd have in the UK as redundancy pay, that if you're having to shrink the business, there's no statutory redundancy pay that you have to pay if you let people go because the business is uh, shrinking in size for economic reasons. Nope, absolutely not. So I mentioned before that an employer in the States can terminate someone for any reason in the sun, and, and I said there's a caveat to that, and that is it can't be an illegal reason. Well, here are the illegal reasons. Uh, so the first two, promissory estoppel and implied contract, what those two mean is that if you make a verbal or a written pro uh, promise to an employee, so for instance, you're opening a business in the U.S. and you're trying to convince someone from the U.K. to come over here, and you give them a nice offer letter that lays out all the salary, all the benefits, the term of their employment, all that good stuff, and they they sell their house and they pack up the the car and they ship everything over to the US, they pull their kids out of school and they come here and by the time they get here your company has had some financial trouble for instance and you can no longer hire that person. Well normally under at will employment uh, you should be able to not hire that person or terminate them for any old reason. Well uh, smart plaintiff attorneys decided that seems decidedly unfair so there's the concept of promissory estoppel or implied contract which says if you make a promise to an employee that is reasonably relied on and the employee suffers some damages to their detriment, 
then you have to pay them for the damages that you caused. In other words, the moving expenses and all the upset that happened with the move. Uh, public policy is another exception to at-will employment. That really has to do with violating either a statute or a constitutional issue or a spirit of jurisprudence. So, for instance, the way that this exception came about was an employee was subpoenaed to appear in court. She put her hand on the Bible, swore to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and she proceeded to say a whole lot of very unfavorable things about the company, who was the defendant in the case, the CEO of the company who was sitting there at the defense table, heard all these terrible things about his company, and after the trial was over and the company lost, he terminated the employee. So the idea that in America, we want our witnesses to feel free to tell the truth and hold truth and nothing but the truth when they take a solemn oath. Uh, lots of, again, smart plaintiff attorneys came out with the idea of a public policy violation. We want to protect the public policy of having witnesses tell the truth in court, and you shouldn't be retaliated against for doing so. And then lastly, protected classification discrimination, which we're going to talk about in a second. Those are the only things that employers can be sued for uh, meritoriously and have it be called wrongful termination under the law. Okay, so here's what I call the employment law alphabet soup. You will see that we Americans love our acronyms and so we've got lots of gobbledygook here on the screen but I can assure you they're all meaningful laws that if you do business in the states you will have to be familiar with at least some of them uh, depending on the size of your organization, some will apply, some won't. But then again, uh, you will have to be very cognizant of state law to make sure that you're not covered under the idea of the federal law just in a smaller state law uh, fashion. Okay, first one, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. So I don't know how, ev how old everyone is here on the call, uh, speaking for Rob and myself, but I seriously doubt uh, anyone else in the room here. If you are over the age of 40 in the U.S., you are considered old. Uh, it's a totally random number that they just picked, but uh, if you are over the age of 40, you are old under the law. If your company has more than 20 employees, then you're covered by the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. And basically, it does exactly what you would think it would do. It says that you cannot discriminate against individuals because of their age. Uh, so we're seeing these cases crop up from time to time. Uh, they're usually very difficult to prove uh, because, generally speaking, employers are not so stupid as to just target older employees. If they do a layoff or if they're uh, terminating someone, they generally have lots of other reasons to terminate them aside from their age. And if they're doing a layoff, they're laying off not just people over 40, but people under 40 as well. So uh, it certainly doesn't look like they're uh, violating the ADEA. I think the other thing to note here, once again, as we've done with other webinars, is when we talk about the number of employees, that's just the number of U.S. employees, not worldwide employees. Right. And also, just to reiterate again, so people just keep, it sinks in, is this is, once again, 20 or more federal at a federal level, Right. So if Ohio, for example, had a law under the Age Discrimination Employment Act of 10, the 10 would trump the 20, and you'd have to follow the 10 if you were in Ohio. Correct. Yeah. Uh, Ohio has one, and we'll get to it in a sec, that says that if you have four employees, you are covered by our version of the Age Discrimination Employment Act. There are lots and lots of states, and I've seen a couple of the people who are on the webinar. Uh, there are states out there, Georgia, I think, jumps to mind, that has a one-employee uh, requirement. California has a, has a lower uh, employment uh, complement requirement. Virtually every state has a state law version of almost every federal law that we're going to be talking about, and they lower the threshold uh, for businesses in those states. So while I'm not uh, suggesting that a lot of age discrimination goes on, things that you have to be cognizant of, I put at the bottom of these slides as important information. Uh, using social media and LinkedIn has become popular as a recruitment tool and as a good employment lawyer I would tell you it is a lousy way to do recruiting uh, because once you open up their Facebook or LinkedIn account you know what color they are you know their age generally you know lots of things about them that you wouldn't know otherwise and once you as an employer know about it you can be questioned about it and potentially litigated uh, against over it so using social media is a very dangerous recruitment tool Avoiding buzzwords during uh, the employment uh, 
process or while the employee is there, uh, geezer, dinosaur, gramps, calling people old, not a good idea, making jokes about age, making assumptions about people who are older that they don't understand technology, things like that. If your application asks for when did they graduate from high school or college, that is just an end around indirect way to try to figure out what, what age they are, so you shouldn't be doing it. Okay. Uh, ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, again, this is another big law here in the states. Uh, you need 15 or more employees to be covered by this one, but again, in Ohio, it's four. In other states, it can be as low as one. Uh, what does the ADA do? It does exactly what you think it should do. It prohibits discrimination against individuals with a disability, either physical or mental. Uh, and if somebody does have a disability, you as an employer are required to engage in uh, a discussion with them about whether or not you can make a reasonable accommodation so that they can do the essential functions of the job unless it causes an undue hardship. In other words, unless it costs you too much money, requires you to hire other people to help them, uh, substantial stress in the business really is what you're trying to uh, demonstrate there in order to avoid uh, making a reasonable accommodation. Uh, the definition of a disability under the ADA, it has to substantially limit one or more major life activities. Uh, but as we'll see on the next slide, uh, there was a moderately recent 2009 amendment that expanded all the definitions of the ADA so that substantially limits now means somewhat hinders and the term major life activities, it used to include major things like breathing, thinking, it now includes bending and walking. So I can make a straight face argument that if you have a sore back and maybe some pulled hamstrings that you are disabled under the law. So you don't worry so much about whether an employee is truly disabled anymore. What you worry about is whether you can accommodate their condition reasonably. Fair Credit Reporting Act. Uh, this is the law that covers all aspects of background screening. So when you are hiring employees, the FCRA comes into play. There, there are lots of documents that you need to fill out in order to do proper background screening. Usually, if you use a reputable background screening company, uh, they will provide you with all the necessary and updated documents. So I would recommend that you do that if you're going to do background screening. It is a great thing to do. You especially want to do it if you've got employees who will be client facing, if they're handling money, if they're going into people's homes, uh, you want to spend the money up front, and it's relatively inexpensive, 25 50 bucks, 100 for a full big search, uh, just to make sure that the person you're hiring is not going to harm you or, or make you uh, uh, get sued down the road. Uh, Seth, from a practical perspective with the background screening, which is a really good idea, in, in the employment process, where do you see most employers doing it sort of? earlier on in the process, once they've decided they want to take that person on, potentially as a last check before they actually let them through the door, where, do you, where would you normally advise them to do it in the process? Yeah, so if you see down in the important information tag at the bottom, there's the concept of ban the box. So the EEOC uh, recently came out with a rule, and lots of states, rather than deal with the EEOC, have passed laws now. So again, you need to know your state law that says that on your job application, you can't ask the question anymore have you been convicted of a felony within the last seven years? It's a very common question to ask on the employment application. However, if your state doesn't have a law in place, you can ignore that rule from the EEOC at your detriment because if the EEOC feels like suing you, they could sue you over it. But uh, depending on the size of the organization, that will depend how early on the company is willing to spend money on the background screen. So you know, if you know you don't want any criminals or people with criminal histories even getting to the interview stage, you'll do it very early on. But usually employers don't invest the money so early in the process, they'll wait till they uh, go down the road a little bit and then do the FCRA background screen as the final barrier to entry and employment. Fair Labor Standards Act uh, is a big one covered by the DOL. I'm not going to go into details. I do half days on the Fair Labor Standards Act all the time, but the things you need to know about most are minimum wage laws. Uh, the federal minimum wage law is 725 and I don't think it went up, uh, but your state law almost certainly is going to be more than that. So there are states in the U.S. that have jumped to uh, states, not just states, but local 
uh, cities and municipalities that have jumped to $15 an hour. Uh, but there are lots of $10 an hour minimum wages out there, so you just, again, have to know what minimum wage your state requires for non-exempt employees that you pay hourly. That's key. Uh, record keeping requirements, again, making sure that your paperwork up front uh, complies with what the DOL wants to see in terms of what their job is, what classification they are, exempt versus non-exempt, uh, and making sure that you keep accurate records of the time that they spend working for you. Uh, common violations, independent contractor is a big issue for uh, the DOL. The DOL is convinced that employers are cheating the government, both federal and state, out of employment uh, tax revenue. So if you use independent contractors, you're going to want to have either a B2B relationship, a business-to-business -business relationship, or have an independent contractor agreement drafted up that specifies and clarifies that the relationship is not employer-employee, it is business and independent contractor. Just, just one thing here which might be useful, which isn't a term we have in the UK, is the <clears throat> exempt versus non-exempt employees. Could you go into that in a little bit more detail, just to explain the differences there? Sure. So exempt employees are those who are exempt from the overtime laws. So in other words, you can pay someone $50,000 a year, and it doesn't matter whether they work 80 hours in a week or 30 hours in a week, they're going to get the same salary every uh, every week, essentially. You don't have to worry about paying time and a half, which is our overtime rate. Uh, there's only a few exemptions that are available, and again, I, I do full days on this, but if uh, if the individual is an executive, uh, in other words, if they're executive level, managerial level, they supervise two or more, that's an executive exempt. Administrative exempt is the most difficult one. That individual has to do non-clerical work and make business decisions that are uh, meaningful, that involve independent judgment uh, with the majority of their time, they can be exempt. Professionals can be exempt, so doctors, lawyers, ar architects, engineers. Uh, outside sales can be exempt, uh, but they truly have to be outside the business, visiting clients and doing sales with the majority of their time. And then uh, computer uh, professionals, people who not just plug things into walls, but can do software, hardware installation. And then lastly, employees who make more than $100,000 a year can be exempt as well. Otherwise, if you're not an exempt employee, then you're a non-exempt employee, which means you have to track hours every week, and the minute they work over 40 hours in a work week, they have to be paid time and a half uh, overtime for that work. Some other common kind of violations were listed there too, breaks and stuff being suffered to work. So if you, if, if you uh, if you have your employees take a lunch break and it's unpaid, you can't force them to work during that lunch period. Tip credits and overtime, that really has to do with uh, restaurants more than anything. Family Medical Leave Act is another big law, but again, it only applies to employers with 50 or more employees. The employee, in order to be eligible, has to work with you for 12 months or 1,250 uh, hours during those 12 months. And what does it give them? It gives them 12 weeks of unpaid, job-protected, health insurance or other insurance continued leave. They can take that leave continually uh, or, intermitt or intermittently. FMLA, again, is very paper-heavy, so uh, having those uh, papers available to hand them out to employees and have doctors certify the condition as a serious medical condition is key. As I mentioned before, the ADA expanded. So some important information that you need to know since the ADA expanded uh, and the definition of disability expanded, therefore the FMLA expanded as well. So what, what uh, is categorized as a serious medical condition is almost everything now too. Bee stings and migraines can get covered by the FMLA. Uh, you have to know as an employer how the FMLA, the ADA, or their state law counterparts and your workers' compensation system work together. So again, states vary greatly from state to state on how workers' compensation works. Uh, so in the state of Ohio, we are a monopolistic state, which means the government runs our workers' compensation. In other states like New York and others, you have to buy a workers' compensation insurance policy, and that's what helps cover workers when they're injured on the job. Uh, FMLA and STD, short-term disability benefit interaction, just knowing how those play together is important. And then FMLA, as many of the laws have in the Obama administration, it has been expanded to cover more and more uh, employees. I think it was, it, just going back up to one of your points there with the short-term disability 
benefit, which I think is something that's important to a lot of the people on the call because with the FMLA, it only applies to employees with more than 50 employees. Right. So in effect is, I think almost everybody on the thing would be become under that limit. So in effect is they aren't required to pay anything for maternity pay under current rules and, or, or anything like that. However, I think from a business perspective, what a lot of companies will put in is the short term, will get a short term disability policy as a benefit for the employees. And it, I know it sounds funny, but my understanding or a little insensitive, but my understanding is that the law defines uh, having, a, having a baby as a short term disability. Yep. And because it's defined as that, when they are off for that period of time, that you, you as the employer or them as the employee can actually make a claim under the short term disability. So it helps you if you want to be a good employer, which I think everybody on here is, it gives you the ability to help fund your employee while they're off without being a huge cost to yourself. That's correct. Yeah. Um, typically what a short term disability policy will do is it'll pay 60 percent or somewhere in the mid 60s uh, percentage of their salary for a period of time. Usually uh, well, it varies uh, short term versus long term. But uh, but yeah, you can buy an insurance policy to do that. And look, I'm not trying to convince anyone to lower themselves to the base standards that are available in the U.S. If you as an employer want to continue, as, as some of the employers on this call have done, uh, when I do their employee handbook, we put policies in place that mimic U.K. policies. And we do put in uh, paid maternity leave, for instance, into the policy. But in the States, unlike elsewhere, you can set those times because there is no law that requires it. Title VII is kind of the granddaddy of them all in terms of federal laws. It covers a whole lot of discrimination and harassment uh, and prohibits it, race, color, religion, sex. I, I put sexual orientation and transgender as not yet. This applies really only to federal contractors right now. So it hasn't gotten expanded to federal law yet, but again, some state laws have started to cover it. So again, you need to know your state law and national origin protection as well. Just want to get an interjection here. We're, <clears throat> we're about 40 minutes through. We've got about another 10 more minutes of materials. But at the moment, it doesn't appear anybody has any questions. So it sounds like you're asking, answering everybody's question. But uh, please remember that uh, there is the question button there. If you've got a question, feel free to type it in. And then we've touched on this a lot. And hopefully the, the point is not getting lost on the audience. But just because you're not covered by a federal law doesn't mean you are not covered by a law. And here is the Ohio law that covers smaller employers. It's Ohio Revised Code 4112. And again, it covers employers with four or more employees. And it does all the same things that the federal laws do. It covers race, as Title VII does, religion, as Title VII does, national origin, Title VII, age, the ADEA, color, sex, Handicap, that's the ADA, ancestry. So the state law does has all the protections of the federal law. It lowers the uh, barrier to entry or what employers get covered, and it does one other major thing, which a lot of state laws do across the country that, that Title VII and other federal laws don't do, and it allows your supervisors to be sued individually, which is a major, major issue, especially if you're a supervisor, because everything you do, and I'll teach everyone on here a little bit of Latin. It's called respondeat superior. So that means your supervisors uh, stand in the place of the CEO. And they stand in the place of the company. So anything your supervisors say or do gets imparted to the company and that's very dangerous. So as a result, uh, spending money again up front on really good documents, good employee handbooks and policies, and then training your supervisors to abide by them both for their own uh, benefit and for yours is key under state law. Then the next slide is just a couple of other things that I've listed off with regard to some of the other agencies and some things that are important to them. So the Department of Labor, uh, I, I mentioned joint employment. Uh, this is a big issue for the Department of Labor which is spilled over to the National Labor Relations Board as well and that's the idea that if you're a franchise or franchisee, or if you use staffing employees, or if you are a staffing employer, as, uh, as one or two are on this call, your employees are out there at someone else's business. And the Department of Labor believes that both you and the business are covered by the wage and hour law. So if the employer does something wrong, or if you do something wrong, 
the Department of Labor is going to come after both of you uh, because they view you as jointly liable. So that's a big, a big issue for staffing companies and for companies who use staffing companies and for companies who use outside independent contractors or anybody else or franchisees. Uh, I mentioned the uncertain white collar exemption standards. We were about to increase the salary level for exempt employees from 23,660, which is very low, to 47,476, which lots of people thought was too high. Uh, there was a court case that stopped it in its tracks. Uh, the injunction's in place. The Department of Labor has appealed it, but now that Trump is in the off, is is the president, he's uh, he's put in a new head of the Department of Labor, and this change is going nowhere. So we are back to our old standards again of 23,660 as the barrier to entry to call someone exempt and not pay overtime. EEOC banned the box. I mentioned that before, but the EEOC has been particularly uh, active in trying to gain information and uh, require employers to provide the EEOC with information to help support its litigation against employers for violating uh, the various discrimination laws. The NLRB, I mentioned before, unless you're dealing with unions, this won't be a, a big issue for you, but uh, they've been active as well with various things. And then lastly, the Bureau of Workers' Compensation. Uh, you just need to know what is going on in your state and make sure that you don't run afoul of any workers' compensation issues or retaliation. Lastly, I just mentioned a few things that I think are helpful to any employer, but particularly employers who are just starting to do business in the U.S., uh, in terms of things to think about uh, when you first start doing business, uh, in terms of preventative measures to avoid litigation, to avoid government uh, entanglements and things like that. So making sure that you've got up-to-date, good employment ap applications and other employment forms, W-4 forms, that's the tax forms, I-9s, W-9s, making sure your immigration and your contractor forms are all up to snuff. Uh, employee handbooks and then training on the employee handbook. So uh, I have lots of employers who try to do it themselves and they'll pull some handbook off the internet and they'll just stick their name on the front of it and call it theirs. Well, a lot of those handbooks were drafted in uh, our wackiest state of the 50 and that is California. And if you do business in California, that's fine because their wacky laws apply to you. But you do not want to use California law if you do business in any other state, because generally speaking, California laws are far more uh, restrictive on employers than, than other states. So making sure you have good handbooks, you make them your own, you spend a little money up front on customizing them, and then training your employees and your supervisors on them. Employment agreements, non-competition non agreements, non-solicitation agreements, and severance agreements. Uh, this, too, is a bit of a difference in terms of what UK and, and EU employers are used to, but here in the States you do not need an employment agreement, but it is often advisable to have an employment agreement uh, because of what they contain. Any employee who could quit your business, go down the street and hurt your business, you probably want to have an employment agreement with. Why? Well, you can put all kinds of things in an employment agreement, not just their salary and their benefits and uh, things like that, but you can also restrict their ability to hurt you out there in the business community through non-compete agreements, non-solicitation agreements, trade secret, confidentiality agreements, things like that. So if you have employees who could hurt you if they go down the street, if they have access to trade secrets or confidential materials, if they are client-facing or in sales, uh, those are the employees in the states that you really want to think about uh, giving an employment agreement to, and again, making sure that it is state law compliant. Uh, because states have very different views on what is fair in terms of non-compete and non-solicitation oftentimes. Last uh, agreement that generally comes up in the process um, when you're letting employees go, and that's severance agreements. I'm a big fan of severance agreements because all you're asking the employee to do is not sue you, and if you don't if the employee agrees not to sue you, you will give them some sort of severance. A week for every year of employment, two weeks, whatever you want to do. It can be any number. There is no scale, no right or wrong reason for giving severance. If you want to do it, you can, but it is a wonderful litmus test to figure out whether you're dealing with an employee that is going to be your friend or potentially could be your enemy and is looking to sue you. So I often recommend that you give severance agreements whenever possible. It's also good 
from an HR perspective to help the employee out, find a new job. You can do outplacement. Uh, it puts you in better standing out there in the business community, perhaps. So it's, it's something to think about doing um, if you're letting go certain employees. Um, detailed job descriptions, also a very good idea. Uh, good protection for wage and hour issues, disability, workers' compensation, supervisory training. I mentioned that before. Drug testing, also a very key thing that isn't on the list here, but something you might want to think about doing. Also legal to do at any stage of the employment process here in the States. ADR programs, that's alternative dispute resolution programs. That requires employees to bring their claims against companies uh, in front of an arbitrator instead of the courts which is faster, less expensive, so sometimes employers want to do that. And then lastly, employment law audits, which basically involves you hiring me, someone like me, or a very skilled HR professional to come in and take a look at all of your employment practices, your forms and things to make sure you're doing things right. Uh, the next two slides are really just more detail on some of the more important things, employment applications and supervisory training, all the different things you can put in an employment application here in the States, as well as different things that you should be thinking about doing with regard to supervisory training. Um, I think that is all we have, and now we are available to do questions, and we might have some. If not, we've got some that we can talk about anyway. So we've got some questions here. So we've got quite a few questions come in now, which is good. Uh, so <clears throat> one of the questions is talking about is uh, with the change of most free administration, do you see or predict any changes in the sort of the U.S. at will employment model? Yeah, at will has been the model for U.S. employment for decades and decades and decades. So uh, I don't anticipate that is going to change at all. Uh, again, this is state law. Um, it is a big state law issue because, again, if you have the uh, fortune of doing business in the state of, let's say, California, California does not necessarily agree with at-will employment and may have other things to say about what your right to terminate someone for any reason is. Uh, so do I think Trump is going to do anything to, to employment at will? Absolutely not. Uh, he's going to continue to I'd say lessen the scope of what's considered a wrongful termination action and uh, at will employment should continue on. Okay, uh, there's been one or, <clears throat> one or two questions come up here regarding uh, exempt and non-exempt employees. Could you, could you just sort of go through again the definitions of an exempt and non-exempt? Uh, some of them are a little bit more specific which we'll deal with offline, sure. but just because it is a different concept than the UK. Yeah, so I don't feel bad if you're confused by this because all kinds of large companies here in the States, Bank of America, Walmart, uh, uh, lots, of, lots, of big, lots of big insurance companies have all gotten stung by class action wage and hour issues all on the subject of who is exempt and who is not exempt. So it doesn't matter if they have a fancy title like vice president of this or that or senior VP of that. It's what they do for a living, what they do day to day. So giving someone a fancy title, a business card, and dressing them up in a nice suit or dress does not get you to an exempt status. It really is what they do for a living. And if you cannot demonstrate to a Department of Labor investigator or to a plaintiff attorney that what that employee does day to day is truly exempt, then they have the right to go back two years or sometimes three years if they think that you willfully violated wage and hour law to hit you for overtime that you did not pay that non-exempt employee for while they were working for you. So what is an exempt versus non-exempt employee? Again, exempt employees fit only into a couple of categories. So there are far more employees out there who are non-exempt than exempt. But executive exemption is, again, your managers and executives and supervisors, but they have to supervise or manage at least two or more employees to be covered by the uh, executive exemption. Uh, administrative exemption. That's the one that catches most employers and gets most employers in trouble. Uh, administrative employees are not clerical employees. They're not administrative employees in the, in the limited sense of, of a secretary or uh, an administrative helper or something like that. An administrative exempt employee 
has to do non-manual, non-clerical work that directly impacts and uh, affects a business, and they have to have uh, decisive and independent judgment uh, over a wide, wide variety of issues. So being able to make an independent judgment decision to buy a box of paper clips is not sufficient enough to get you to the administrative exemption. You have to make meaningful decisions day to day with the majority of your time to be an administrative exempt employee. And lots of mortgage companies, lots of banks had guys and gals running around in suits with fancy business cards who they considered exempt. But at the end of the day, all they did was hand a clipboard with pre-done pre forms and asked people to fill them out, and then they transferred those forms to the loan department, and the bank treated them as exempt, and they were not exempt, and they should have been paid overtime for all of those hours they were working. So that's a bad one, uh, and a difficult one to navigate. Professional employees, that's easy, that's lawyers, that's doctors, that's architects, that's people with advanced degrees or the creative class, uh, people who are artistically inclined, uh, you can be a professional exempt there. In terms of computer exemption, that too is a little bit confusing from time to time, but we're generally not talking about simple computer uh, people when we're talking about the computer exemption. We're talking about people who make at minimum $27.63 an hour, and they have to not just be able to plug in computers, they have to program them, they have to do uh, hardware installation, high level computer programmer type people can be exempt as well. Outside sales, your salespeople who visit customers almost exclusively, and don't work out of their house more than they're out visiting customers doing sales, those can be exempt. And then lastly, employees who make more than $100,000, uh, the highly compensated individuals can be exempt as well. And once again, from the if you are a non-exempt, so you're an hourly uh, sort of, or a lower salary, not meeting one of the exceptions, what you can't do as well either is if you have a contract where you pay them 40 hours a week, and they maybe work 30 hours, 35 hours one week, they can't work 45 hours the next week without having to pay them five hours of overtime. Is that correct? Right. The Department of Labor has tunnel vision when it comes to this. So the Department of Labor is only concerned about the work week. So you can't swap hours out if an employee who's not exempt and is paid either salary or hourly. They can be paid either way, but if they're paid a salary, $30,000 a year, but they're a secretary, let's say, uh, you have to take that $30,000 salary and turn it into an hourly rate, and if they work more than 40 in that week, pay them overtime on that hourly rate times time and a half for that week. Uh, could you turn around and say, you know what, you you made you made overtime this past week, so this coming week I'm gonna I'm gonna only have you work 35 hours. You can do that, but what you can't do is say, well, you worked 45 hours this week. Instead of paying you overtime this week, I'm just gonna uh, have you. I'm just going to add them, uh, have you work less hours next week. You have to pay overtime on each work week. Okay. Uh, this is an interesting question because we talked about this is, obviously when we talk about employee handbooks, obviously when you're a small business and you're setting up, you want to be compliant, but at the same time you've got to run a business. Yep. Is there a, a, a mandatory or a, or a specified level of the number of employees that you'd have where you'd recommend getting a handbook? Yeah, I, again, this is sort of a state law issue. So uh, in the great state of Ohio, where we're sitting right now, if an employer has more than four employees, they're subject to all of the discrimination laws. So generally speaking, my advice is take a look at your state law and however many employees gets you covered under the state law discrimination or harassment uh, laws, that's when you want to start thinking about having a handbook. Do you need a handbook if you have one employee? Probably not. Uh, but if you have uh, three, four, five, ten, uh, at that point, you're creeping very close to the federal laws, too. So at that point, I would want to have good policies and procedures in place so that it's it's a wonderful defense to any kind of liability or litigation case. Perhaps you, uh, <clears throat> a few questions have come in talking about, obviously, difference between the UK. So talking about when you lay people off, whether it's for good, good, bad, and different growing, uh, business downsizing. Can you maybe go through that just again a little bit of the, of what you need to be aware of if you are laying somebody off for cause, no cause, if you're making them redundant? Could you address that again a little bit more? Yeah, again, as, a, as an at-will country, which is what we are, uh, you can lay off employees anytime uh, for any reason. 
and you do not have to pay any severance or do anything really uh, with regard to layoffs. Uh, uh, some municipalities uh, might have some strange local laws with regard to who you have to report your layoffs to, but generally speaking, if we're not talking about a, a big layoff, which is covered by uh, the WARN Act, the Workers Adjustment uh, Act, then we're just talking about a layoff that's that's fairly limited. And, and so then as the employer, it's up to you what you want to do. If you want to provide them with a severance agreement, you can, but you're not required to by law. You can provide continuing, uh, continuing benefits. You can provide continuing salary. They're, as, a, as a layoff, they're going to get covered by unemployment, undoubtedly. So there is a bit of a safety blanket there. But otherwise, it's uh, for any reason you can do it, and then whatever you want to give them, you can. Okay. I was going to say, being very cognizant of everybody's time, I know we haven't managed to get through all the questions. So as mentioned before, uh, any questions we haven't answered, or if we have answered your question, you've still got a question, you've all got my email, please email me the question, and uh, Seth is more than happy to follow up with you. Uh, like I said, I'd like to thank Seth very much for the last hour. I've certainly learned a lot of stuff in the last couple of days when we've been working together on this, and hopefully everybody has picked something up from here. Uh, as I can say, uh, we, we will be doing another one of these in the series, maybe in about three or four months' time. So if you do have any quest any uh, things that are coming up in your day-to-day -day business life that you'd like to learn a little bit more about from a business perspective that you think is completely different than the UK, email me because we are looking for ideas to make sure they're uh, it's all relevant to everybody listening, but just to just to finish, Seth, for a second, is if there was two takeaways from your presentation today that everybody should just think about and at least pick up two things, what would those couple of things be? Well, I tell you, just not make the mistake that many employers do that they just fly by the seat of their pants and try to do things as cheaply as possible on the front end because the the back end is going to be far, far, far more expensive and time consuming than spending a little bit of time and money and uh, making sure your documents and your forms are well prepared, that are prepared by someone who actually knows the law of the state that you're doing business in. Uh, the days of using generalists uh, are done, so using a corporate lawyer to try to figure out employment law just isn't possible anymore. The laws change much too quickly here in the states uh, for anyone to be up to speed on it unless they specialize in it. So certainly making sure that you do things right on the front end is, is certainly a takeaway. Um, and then if I haven't harped on it enough, uh, I haven't been doing my job, and that is state law, state law, state law. The U.S. is in many ways made up of 50 individual little countries. And uh, if you do not know the laws of your state, uh, one size does not fit all. You cannot have the same policies and procedures oftentimes uh, if you have a business that's in Chicago, Ohio, California, and Texas, it's very different uh, from state to state. So just making sure that you always take state law into account is essential. Okay. <clears throat> thank you very much, Seth. I think we're spot on the hour. So uh, I'd like to thank everybody for listening. And like I said, hopefully everybody's picked something up. What we will uh, do is we will send out a link to everybody, a link to the recording of this. So if you want to go back and listen to them pieces again, It'll be there, but I will send that out later today or tomorrow for you. Anyway, many thanks for everybody listening and hope everybody has a good rest of the day.